Welcome to Y Lab, where the makerspace located in the historic workshops of the David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada, where if you stick around, you might see some deer and coyotes walking around, but so far, no moose. This is lesson zero, our tips and tricks for study and taking the Canadian Amateur Radio Training Test. So welcome to the test prep slides. This is for the Canadian basic and basic with honors test. It's not for the advanced test. The slides are designed to help get you through the test along with the quizzes we've created. We still recommend you have the study guide as a reference. You should eventually be reading a lot of other material like the Industry Canada rules and you'll need to consult band plans and things like that. And the best way to do that is get together with a ham radio club. So about these slides, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we cover the bare minimum. We're really laser focused on getting you what you need to pass the test, to help you remember that material to pass the test so you can get on the air. The bad part of this, and we'll admit it, is you may not be getting a lot of the info that you should know for being on the air. But that's okay. There's lots of people out there to help you. Getting your ticket, as they call it, or your license, is important and we're getting you through that. And the ugly part is, ah, you're gonna forget most of that material anyway and never use it. So get your license, get some equipment, get together with other hands, start tinkering, get on the air and keep learning. Now, we wanna alert you to some things that cause confusion in the test. There are a lot of terms that mean exactly the same thing and they constantly switch between them in the questions. Ham operators and the documents and the quiz questions switch between the same terms constantly and it's confusing as heck for beginners. Now this is mostly historical, it's not malice, it's just the terms that ham and radio operators have learned to use. And you know, these questions were written back in the dark ages. So don't worry, just be aware of it and you'll get used to it. So the first confusion, receiver, transmitter, and transceiver. So in the old days, you had a separate receiver and transmitter and each of them took two people to carry. They were as big as the biggest PC you've ever seen. They had vacuum tubes, they were just enormous. Now, pretty much all modern equipment combines the two into a transceiver. So even a, a handheld walkie-talkie, a handheld radio, transmits and receives, so it's a transceiver. Now the test questions mostly treat them separately. So you need to watch for which term is used, receiver or transceiver, because just that little bit of information, are you dealing with signals coming in or are you dealing with sending signals out, is very important and will often help you figure out the answer to the question. Next confusion, frequency, band, and bandwidth. Ham operators will say something's on the 10 meter band. Now it's a simple calculation from the speed of light that we'll cover in other sections, but a 10 meter band is the same as 30 megahertz. We'll cover this, don't worry. Now a band is a range or frequency allocated to something. So you'll get a band going from 29 and a half megahertz to 29.7 megahertz, and you're allowed to communicate in there. Now, if you do your calculation, that doesn't exactly correspond to a 10 meter band. Uh, and so things vary a little bit. The, the math doesn't always match up. A lot of the bands are named for traditional reasons. Now, so we've got a band that goes from 29 and a half to 29.7 but you don't need that much. You only need a small portion of it for your communication. And the amount you need within the band is your bandwidth. So when we talk about a 30 megahertz band, you might be allowed six kilohertz of bandwidth for your communication. And your signal frequency is the middle of that six kilohertz. So let's give you an example. So with a basic license, you're not allowed to communicate, with a couple of exceptions, you're not allowed to communicate below 30 megahertz. So you need six kilohertz to hold, to carry your voice in that band. So 
if you're transmitting at 30.006 megahertz, that's uh, 30, 30,006 kilohertz, uh, you're using the bandwidth from 30.003 to 30.009. And that's all above that 30 megahertz mark. So you're good. That's where you're allowed to operate. On the other hand, if you're transmitting at a frequency of 30 megahertz, which is your center point, then you're spilling over. Your bandwidth that you're using is going from 29.997 to 30.003. So you're crossing the line. Next bit of confusion, radiation, radio, and RF. They're all the same thing. Radio is a form of radiation, and it's at frequencies and, more importantly, power levels that we use for radio communication. So the terms are used interchangeably, and they're even used in combination. So you'll see RF, RF radiation, radiation. And you'll see it as a verb, radiates or radiating. All the same thing. Harmful radiation is still RF, and often at the same radio frequencies. Uh, your microwave cooks food at around 2.4 gigahertz, which coincidentally is the same frequency that's used for your cordless phone and a lot of uh, RC toys. But it's at different power levels, and the power affects as much or more than the frequency. Okay? So ham training will teach you to be safe, and not have you or someone else end up a medium rare meat sack. Okay? Now for the test, something important. Radio or RF, when you see that, it's higher frequencies, up in the kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz, right up to hundreds of megahertz and gigahertz. That'll be important. You'll understand why in a second. Audio, speech, and voice. Okay, so audio, what you can hear with your ears and speak with your mouth goes into your transmitter, usually through a microphone. And it comes out of your receiver through a speaker or a set of headphones. Okay? And audio is relatively low frequency. You know, our ears can hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and less than that as we get older. Um, and so relative to radio, it's much, much lower. The radio is usually in the 100 kilohertz minimum. And... While the full range of audio for, for a child that still has great hearing is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, you know, and you want a big range if you're listening to music or something like that, or a soundtrack of your favorite movie, uh, just to transmit our voice, we only need a small portion of that. We only need 300 hertz to 3000 hertz. That's all we need. And you'll learn you're not allowed to transmit music on amateur radio. So we don't need a lot for our voice. So for voice, you're going to see terms used interchangeably. You'll see speech amplifier, voice amplifier, audio amplifier. Okay? And that stuff goes into an amplifier from a mic, or it goes from an amplifier out to a speaker. So anytime you see those terms, speech, voice, audio, really low frequency, speaker, mic, we're talking about audio. Confusion number four, electricity and some of the components. We all know voltage, but in uh, pure science terms, it's also known as electromotive force. Uh, and there's Ohm's law. If you don't know it, you'll learn about it. That's voltage is I current times R resistance. But you'll see the exact same formula with E. So capital E, capital V, same thing. Electromotive force, voltage. Voltage is is a differential across a component. Uh, they talk about voltage drop. So if you think about it, uh, you know, you stack your two batteries together in a flashlight. Each one is one and a half volts. You stack them up, you got three volts. So they call it a voltage drop. It's a differential, a reference to ground, things like that. Uh, so a voltage drop is the amount of voltage. And then one of the other components that's important in radio is an inductor, which is literally a coil of metal. And people will call it a coil, they'll call it a choke, they'll call it an inductor. It's all the same thing. 
Confusion number five, signal power decibels. Okay, dB, you'll see that. dB is short, it's the abbreviation for decibels. Now, decibels is a relative thing. It's not absolute. Let's talk about that a bit. So gain is how much you're increasing in power, and it's measured in decibels. So we're talking about two times, four times, things like that. Doubling the power is a 3 dB gain. So it doesn't matter if you started with 100 watts or you started with 500 watts. A 3 dB gain is doubling that power, whatever you started with. And double it again is another 3 dB gain. So if you had 100 watts, go up 3 dB, it means you're at 200 watts. Go up another 3 dB, you're doubling again. So you're not at 300 watts, you're doubling from where you started, 200 to 400 watts. Again, we'll cover this some more in more detail. And a 10 times increase is 10 dB. The math is a little funky, uh, but if you just remember these things, and we will be going over them some more, you'll get fine in the test. And the reason for this is what's important is not how much you're transmitting, it's how, how you're being received. So you're transmitting... And I've got a crappy radio set. And I say, hey, I'm not hearing you properly. You know, it's kind of scratchy. Can you up your power? Uh, so I'll be showing a low power level because I've got a crappy antenna and a crappy receiver. And then you, you double your power. Uh, and now I'm seeing, you know, a 3 dB gain. It looks a lot better. But the guy next door who's got a great antenna, you were coming through loud and clear the first time. And, you know, if he doubles the power, it's going to be way, way high. He's going to see something a lot higher on his meters than I do. So, remember, we are talking about relative stuff, and that's important. That's why the dB gain stuff is relative. It's always a multiple uh, of where you started. Now, before answering any question, read all of the answers. Don't just read the first one. You go, this is correct, and click the button, and then you find it's a mistake, and you're going, what's going on? A lot of the questions are of the form, which of the following is not correct? And your eye will often miss that when you're reading the questions. So take a look. Read all the answers, and if most of them make sense. That's a clue. Go back, read the question carefully. You'll usually see that not in there somewhere. And the answer, the correct answer, is the only one that doesn't make sense. You'll also find sometimes that uh, the test will have some real new terms and gibberish in, the, uh, in some of the answers that you won't remember at all from the material or from the class. That's usually a really good indication that it's an incorrect answer. Okay. I already gave an example of this 30 megahertz barrier. Uh, again, the barrier between the people who have uh, the basic license, which is only allowed to transmit above 30 megahertz, and the one with people with advanced license or uh, basic with honors who are allowed to uh, transmit below that. And don't worry, we'll be covering these license levels in some of the quizzes. Okay? So uh, 30 megahertz is key. Uh, what you'll see is above 30 megahertz frequencies will be described as VHF, very high frequency, and UHF, ultra high frequency. Uh, if you think of VHF, that's where your old TV signals from 2 to 13 used to come in. And the UHF is those channels higher than that. FM radio is in these ranges. So 30 megahertz is an important barrier. Uh, then you'll also see 30 to 300 megahertz. This is where the maximum radiation exposure risk is. Weird. You know, our FM signals are in that range and stuff like that. Uh, but at high power, that's the range that actually has the maximum risk. At the power levels we're using, we're usually okay unless we're sticking our faces right on the antenna with a high power transmitter. Finally, the, the ham radio golden rule for a lot of the questions on the test 
is manners, good manners. The airways are provided to all amateurs at no charge. Anybody can use them, and if we all respect the rules, we can share them, and there's plenty of bandwidth for everybody. So we have to be nice to each other. For many, many questions in the test, the correct answer is simply, what is the nicest, most polite behavior? The nicest way I can behave to the other people on the air, the other operators. And you'll find just this simple rule gets you through a lot of the questions. Okay, so again, how we recommend you study. Read the slides or this video, which is the slides. Again, you get tired of my voice, you can just take the slides. Take the test, use the hints, and repeat it until you pass with 90 to 95% accuracy without the hints. And again, three times usually does it, even for the toughest sections. And then before you go on to the next test, hey, go back, repeat, review the other tests you did. You know, it's important and it'll help you remember. Then move to the next module and start the process again. Now that you've had the intro material, you know about the test and how we teach it, get moving on test one. Again, this is YLab, and uh, we thank you for uh, watching this video. Please post any comments below.